Hey peeps, welcome into another edition of Rockets Cast Live here on Rockets.com. He is the Grand Poobah of Everything.com Central here for the Rockets. I'm Craig Ackerman, your Rockets radio play-by-play -play voice. Houston now two and two on this young NBA season and dropping to 0 and two at Toyota Center following last night's 93-87 loss to the Denver Nuggets and the Rockets. Two home games so far this year. They have scored 85 points in overtime, 87 points last night. Shot 37% from the field against the Nuggets and 35% from the floor against the Portland Trailblazers. Needless to say, say, the story, at least at the top of today's show, is going to be the Rockets' offense bogging down considerably. But again, welcome to another edition of Rockets Cast Live. Jason, Craig with you here. We want to uh, answer as many questions from all of you as we can. You can tweet Jason at RocketsJCF. Please use the hashtag RocketsLive. We'll get to those questions here shortly but uh, again Jason after a fantastic start two wins on the road doesn't matter who you're playing in the NBA winning on the road is never easy the Rockets did that in Detroit they turned around and did it in Atlanta with back-to-back -back historical games for one James Harden but as he has struggled 8 of 24 uh, he went against Portland and just 5 of 15 last night against the Nuggets the Rockets offense has come to a screeching halt and again 86 points on average per game and the two home games thus far is just not going to get the job done. No, it's not. And, I mean, you look at the numbers and, and they tell the story. Mentioned this the other day. These numbers, especially as they pertain to rankings, are going to fluctuate wildly as we get more data. Right now you can only make so much of what you've seen, but uh, we can go based on what we have right now, and that's four games' worth of data. And right now the Rockets, from an offensive efficiency standpoint, rank 24th in the NBA, along with the likes of Brooklyn, Sacramento, New Orleans, Indiana, Philadelphia, and Washington. And that's not good enough. Uh, from a defensive standpoint, much better. The Rockets are actually ranked in the top 10. Uh, other things they're doing well, rebounding-wise, number four in the NBA and rebound rate. That's awesome. That's the Omer Ashik effect, largely. Um, things they're not doing so well, pretty obvious. Uh, turning the ball over way, way, way too much. Rockets bottom five in the NBA and turnover rate. And uh, that is really hurting things. I mean, when you're turning the ball over a bunch and you're trying to develop chemistry and in the process you're stagnating and lacking ball movement and all the other things that Kevin McHale is preaching, uh, that's going to make things awfully tough on you. Now that said, uh, you know, the first two games, you thought this was going to be a very explosive offense, and I still think it has the potential to be that. But one of the things I saw is just it seems like a team, you know, you, you come into Detroit and there are no expectations. You've had basically no practice time. Um, and so I think it was just more instinctive, intuitive, free-flowing basketball. And now that they're trying to get a feel for each other, trying to incorporate – uh, some more plays and, and some more chemistry. It does seem like it's not second nature anymore. That there's it was in the thinking. preseason. I mean, they 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 from right, day but that, one. That, but that's a different group. Right, I know that's that's what I'm saying. It, it was a completely different group. They had a month to work with one another. They were preaching pace and space from the moment they hit the floor. And it really does seem, especially the pace that this team has been playing with the man. Uh, you know, they're not the last couple of games, at least at home, they haven't been pushing the pace as well as they want to. And then when they do get into the half court, um, the, the, the ball movement is not there. The man movement uh, hasn't been there, what we saw in the preseason. Again, grain of salt, preseason versus regular season, two completely uh, different animals. But this, this, they, they have gotten bogged down in the half court. We touched upon this a little bit coming out of that game against Portland uh, on Tuesday. But we really saw it. Um, we kind of attributed some of that to the fact that, again, not much practice time third game in four nights, second night of a back-to-back, -back. but they had a couple a day off on Sunday, two days to practice this week, and it actually looked like things from that perspective. Look, some nights you're going to hit your shots, some nights you're not. The, the, the coaches actually felt like in, against Portland, they got all the shots they wanted to. They, they had almost a six, almost 60% of their tries were within five feet at the rim. So if you're going to go into a game-in, game-out basis, and you're going to get that many shot attempts that close to the basket as a team – you're going to feel real good about yourselves. Now, they missed 10, 15 layups that particular game, so they, were not, they couldn't finish 
that night, but they were happy with their shot selection against Portland. They had a lot, a lot of wide open looks at the trees that they just did not hit. Uh, but again, it does seem like after a couple of days of practice this week when we thought maybe that pace would return, it didn't. It took a little bit of a step back last night. Now you have to give the other team some credit. Andre Iguodala um, is one of the top five on-ball wing defenders in the NBA, and James Harden's task is not going to get any easier tomorrow night in Memphis because I think Tony Allen is number one in the league in terms of wing defenders in the NBA. But Iguodala, I put, I put LeBron at number one. Okay, but, but I mean, but you're right. When it comes to LeBron, Iggy, and Tony Allen, that's the cream of the crop. That's as good as it gets from Iggy a wing was fan. He was great. Fantastic last night defensively on James Harden. And, and look, even though the game turned to small ball in the fourth quarter, the Denver Nuggets have a bunch of trees down low, a bunch of extremely long athletic players. And if you happen to break their perimeter defenders off on the dribble and get into the lane, it's tough to finish on them. They do create turnovers. They're one of the more athletic teams in the league. So as poorly as the Rockets shot the ball last night, again, you got to give Denver credit. I think yeah, Portland's Starting five is very athletic as well. Defensively, they're going to give teams some problems. So you have to give them some credit. It's not just one team struggling versus one team doing well. It's usually a combination of both. It's a gray area. It's usually the truth is somewhere in between. Um, but, again, the Rockets, 8 of 33 from 3 uh, last night. Uh, but right off the bat, Jason, what you can blame the Rockets for, again, I don't think there was a lot of ball movement. There wasn't much man movement away from the basketball. And right off the bat, James Harden, I think, personally set a bit of a a poor tone for the team offensively because right there, the first couple of three possessions for the Rockets, I thought he was really trying to force the issue, drive the lane into two, sometimes three defenders looking for the call that never happened. It frustrated him. It frustrated the team. And even though you got to give the team credit, they were down by 15 at halftime. They never gave up. They fought back. They fought back, got to within two late in the third, really were right there with an opportunity to potentially win the game late with the exception of a Gallinari tipping off a missed free throw, Kenneth Fareed doing a, another fantastic manimal impersonation, and then there was the offensive pass interference call that wasn't on Andre yeah. Iguodala, and the Rockets, again, fighting it up to a climb the entire second half, just couldn't get over the hump. Yeah, and you know, look, there's no way around it. Yesterday was not James Harden's finest hour. Uh, he, he definitely struggled. In terms of taking it into the paint, I, I typically I don't have too much of a problem with that. I mean, those are <laughs> those are crimes of aggression, and whether it's James Harden or Jeremy Lin, uh, I'm not going to critique them too much for trying to make things happen on penetration, because the fact of the matter is is that more often than not, they're going to end up getting to the line, and and there were some reach ins that weren't called, and I'm not blaming this on the refs at all. Just saying that. Typically, a player of James Harden's caliber or Jeremy Lin's caliber, when they're penetrating, they're going to draw fouls. And when the Rockets' offense is bogged down and stagnant, that's a good way to get things going. It's also going to help your defense at the other end because if you're shooting free throws, the other team is not going to get transition opportunities. So, you know, that, that no, no, I can, I can forgive very right easily. Jason, is that I think far too many times he went one-on-two, one-on-three, and you're simply not – going to get the benefit of the doubt from the officials in those circumstances because you're, it's, you're, the, the odds are against you as an offensive player. If it's one-on-one, -on -one, yes, you're going to get the benefit of the call from the officials. But when you're going one-on-three, more times than not, the officials seeing it in real time see the same things that we do, and it sees, seems like it's, you're seeing a, a player forcing the issue against multiple defenders. And, and, and that's, that's where my critique, particular last night of James, who had six turnovers. Now, the free throw aspect that you mentioned, the Rockets didn't get to the line hardly at all in the first half. But, yes, they did use the free throw line to right the ship in the second half. What did they have? Let me see. I'm looking at my halftime box. They had six free throw attempts in the first half, 17 in the second half. That's why they were able to whittle that deficit down in the second half because they were able to get to the free throw line. But I, I do agree with that. When you're struggling on offense, one way to counteract that uh, and to calm things down as we get to the free throw line. And I thought they were more cognizant of that in the second half. But, again, you're not going to win on the road, let alone winning at home in this league, when you shot the ball as poorly as the Rockets have the last two games in particular. Well, so, and, and, that, and that comes to another issue, which is your offense is always going to look ugly when you're shooting the ball poorly. It's a Rockets team that, that wants to use the three-point play 
or the three-point shot as a significant weapon in their arsenal. And right now, outside of Carlos Delfino, nobody's shooting the three ball better than 30%. And that's a problem. Um, now, do the Rockets have some issues in terms of chemistry, cohesion, and uh, the stagnation? Of course they do. I mean, we, we've touched on that. And I, I think to a certain extent, um, in James Harden and Jeremy Lin, I do think they can complement each other, but I do think the Rockets are going through some of the growing pains. And I'm not trying to compare James Harden and Jeremy Lin to LeBron James and Dwayne Wade, but I will say that, you know, from the standpoint of both of those guys at this point in their careers tend to be best with the ball in their hands. That's not a surprise. James Harden's one of the league's elite pick and roll players. Well, if you're going to be an elite pick and roll player in the backcourt, you're going to got to have the ball in your hands. Jeremy Lin was elite as an isolation player last year. Same thing holds true. What Jeremy Lin is not is a great spot up shooter. And that was sort of some of the problems that LeBron and D Wade had together was that neither one of those guys is great and all time talented as they are. It's not, it took them time to get used to what do they do as an offensive player if they're simply spotting up behind the three-point line, when that's not either one of those guys' strengths. And the Rockets are going through sort of trying to figure out how do they mesh these guys who are tremendously skilled and maximize their efforts whether, rather than marginalize. Now, we're getting a ton of questions, and this is not surprising. What I don't want to make this out at at all is a James Harden versus Jeremy Lin debate that they're that they don't complement each other, that the ball needs to be in Jeremy's hands more, or that any of that stuff. This is not about you're a James Harden fan or a Jeremy Lin fan. This is about how can the Rockets mesh this, these talents, and not just James and Jeremy, but Chandler Parsons, Patrick Patterson, Omer Oshik, and make the most and come together as a group. And that's where you sort of have to sit back after a while and realize, all right, you can't overreact about two straight losses any more than you should have overreacted after two straight wins. That there are going to be ups and downs because this team has been together for all of 10 days and that you're four games into the season. Is it going to take time? Absolutely. It's a good problem to have. I mean, let's face it, you know, no doubt Jeremy Lin and Kevin Martin, I think, had that chemistry by the end of preseason. But the James Harden-Jeremy Lin combo has a much higher ceiling. But they need time to figure things out the same way that Kevin and Jeremy did. And so I think that, to me, it's going to be really interesting to see how the coaching staff works with basketball operations to try and put together a game plan that is going to maximize what these guys can do for you on the court. We know that they're both excellent when it comes to attacking and creating off the dribble, either for themselves or for their teammates, uh, aggressive, getting to the uh, foul line, setting up rim shot opportunities for uh, their teammates and for themselves, but being able to mesh those two talents together, um, it's going to take some time. And I think that these last two games have hammered that point home. And hey, let's, let's, let's be honest. You, there's nowhere to hide in this league. After the Rockets and James Harden lit the NBA by storm on those first two games, there is a thing called game film, a game tape that opposing coaches watch. Right. And, and they, they adjust. So now it's up to the Rockets to adjust to their adjustments, quite frankly. And, and, and that's the chess game that's played between coaching staffs and players. Um, other teams are there once they get a look at what you do and teams are, are, are scouted. In addition to the film, they're scouted extensively. So everybody, there, there are no secrets in the NBA, you know, everybody knows what the other team is going to do, so it's, a, it's incumbent upon the players and the coaches to then in turn adjust, and now it's the Rockets' opportunity here in this chess game to adjust to opposing teams' adjustments defensively on James because they're really, really working hard to take the ball out of his hands. I think we saw that, I don't know if you caught any of the, uh, the Mavericks and Blazers game after the Blazers were in Houston the other night. I mean, they were doing the same thing to Damian Lillard, and, and the Blazers looked uh, looked a little bit lost. So you're going to have to expect these sorts of things the rest of the way, and the Rockets are going to have to find a way to redesign what they do to counterbalance what opposing teams are doing defensively. But, again, this is Rockets Cast Live, hashtag Rockets Live, tweet Jason at Rockets JCF. Let's get to the questions. Yeah, and one other thing I just want to mention, Craig, is that when you're talking about Jeremy Lin and James Harden, 
you're talking about two exceedingly unselfish players. So uh, I, I just think that, again, it, it's, it's going to take time, but this is, this is definitely a problem that has a solution. Um, I, I don't think that, you know, there's going to be any sort of concern about one guy is just going, you know, I talked about this on Tuesday. Neither one of these guys is going to go Kobe Bryant on you and just say, the ball's got to be in my hands. I've got to get 25 shots a game. I've got to be the primary creator. They want to make this work. They want to make each other better as well as their teammates. It's going to happen, but it just doesn't happen overnight. And I wrote about this in the story. You had Kevin Garnett of the Boston Celtics who have won a championship together, who have been together now for five years talking about how chemistry is not an overnight process because they struggled to beat the Washington Wizards at home last night. You have the Lakers now one and four with probably four Hall of Famers on their team who are struggling to find chemistry together. What on earth makes you think that this Rockets team that's the youngest roster in the NBA and that has been together 10 days is going to just be able to fly through, skip through the growing pains that come with the chemistry process? It just doesn't work like that. All right, so really good questions that we got, I thought, from uh, David Weiner. A few people follow him on Twitter. It's uh, at Bima Thug, and he's awesome, awesome, awesome on Clutch Fans. Uh, he wants to know if we think that Mikhail will explore a big lineup that features Carlos Delfino at the shooting guard, Marcus Morris at small forward, and that way it would allow Terrence Jones to get into the game. Well, then where's James Harden? Well, I think he's talking more about not not a starting lineup, but uh, a lineup that you can throw out there off the bench. Um, that, because, you know, Marcus Morris is not going to start over Chandler Parsons. Carlos Delfino clearly not going to start over James Harden. But a second group that comes in off the bench that would – perhaps help you. And obviously it's going to depend on matchups, but also would allow a guy like Terrence to get some playing time too. And we've talked about this and I know there are a lot of people complaining about, well, why aren't they playing the young guys? Well, first of all, and, and this is something that really gets to me. They are playing young players. Yes. Jeremy Lin's a young player. James Harden is a young player. Omer Oshik is young. He's starting for the first time in his career. Patrick Patterson is starting for the first time in his career. Chandler Parsons is only in his second year in the NBA. They are playing young players. Marcus Morris, in essence, is a rookie. Um, Greg Smith. Greg Smith. Cole Aldrich basically has very little playing experience in the right. NBA. The only guy who's actually seen any consistent time in the league outside of James Harden, who came as a reserve, has been Carlos Delfino. They are playing young players. Now, when you look at the young players, the rookies in particular, who aren't playing, White, Montiunas, Machado, Jones, I'm just I'm telling you point blank right now. Three of those four are not ready yet. They're not ready yet. I'm not saying that they won't be ready. I'm just telling you right now, they are not ready yet. The one that does surprise me, we talked about this on Tuesday and a little bit last week and before that, coming out of the game in, in Detroit, when Marcus Morris got the start for Patterson, who was still out with a foot problem, and Terrence Jones got the DNP CD. He is the guy that I will admit but I am still surprised I haven't seen any floor time because, A, he started when Patterson missed the three games in the preseason, and, B, I thought he certainly acquitted himself nicely. And amongst those four rookies, of all of them, he is the guy who, in my opinion, is most NBA ready at this particular moment. And for those reasons, yes, I am surprised that he hasn't played. But you look, again, you look at three of those four rookies, Demo, White, Jones, there is so much redundancy in the positions that they play. Inevitably, again, this goes back to the whole you can't play everybody thing. Where, where, if you say, okay, we're going to play player X, then you have to take those minutes away from player Y. Or are you going to take those away from Patrick Patterson at this juncture? I would Absolutely play. not. Patrick Patterson at 18 points last night, very good defender. I thought he has, he has played so smart defensively, uh, it's not even funny. You can take those minutes away from Omer. Ashik to go a little bit smaller. No, Monte Yunus, it does not have the strength yet. Uh, Terrence Jones, um, more of a four than a five. I can see him there a little bit. But, but frankly, look, uh, Greg Smith uh, played extremely well in place of Ashik in Detroit before he ended up getting hurt. 
so uh, yeah, I could potentially see a, a different uh, rotation there with Jones going small with more sliding over to three for Parsons as opposed to backing up Patrick at the four and then moving Delfino over the two. And Delfino's a guy who can swing. So long story short, just to quell the argument about why aren't the young guys playing. They are playing young guys, but I'm telling you right now, three of those four guys, um, if the coaches felt comfortable with them, they would be playing them. They're not anti-rookie, trust me. Um, but I will admit that, yes, I am still surprised a little bit that, that Terrence Jones, based on what he did in the preseason, hasn't seen any four times at this point. Well, yeah. and my point, Craig, is, look, the last two games, what have we seen? We've seen a disjointed Rockets team that is in search for chemistry and an identity. We've seen a Rockets team that is turning the ball over at, unfortunately, a rather prolific rate. Are you really telling me that adding a rookie to that mix, another really young player, a guy who's essentially had all of five weeks with the real club, um, you know, if you go back to October 2nd and the start of training camp, are you telling me that that is going to solve the chemistry issues, that that is going to mitigate, mitigate the turnover problems? I, hey, I just think that that's something. And I've heard the argument – well, why not just throw these guys in for a couple of minutes at the end of the first quarter or something like that? I'm telling you, playing a guy for two or three minutes does more harm than good because they're not out there enough to develop any sort of a rhythm. And then if they perform poorly, then you're looking at a, an issue affecting their confidence and so on and so forth. If you're going to play guys, you have to play them regular rotation minutes on a game-in, game-out basis. If after eight or nine, ten games, this group is still struggling, I'm telling you, look at last season, right. and, and, I, and I realize that Chandler Parsons fit a niche, but it was Chase Budinger as the starter at the, the small forward. The Rockets were horrendous defensively, and that's why Chandler earned playing time, because he fit a role. I'm telling you right now, if these guys prove their worth in practice, they will be playing in the games, but you cannot – just sporadically play one guy here, one guy there, a couple of minutes here, a couple of minutes there. It just does, it, it it hurts. It hurts already fragile chemistry that this team has. Not not in terms of bonding, but chemistry on the floor of this new group, as you illustrated. They've been together a week and a half after one group was together with each other for an entire month. Now that the whole dynamic of the rotation and roster changed with, on that Saturday night when the Rockets picked up Aldrich and Cook and Harden from Oklahoma City. You can't play everybody. You can't play guys sporadically. And I'm telling you, if the Rockets go a couple more games and Marcus Morris is still shooting one for seven, I promise you something something will change. But for now, you can't just continue after one game or two games, have a knee-jerk reaction as a coaching staff, pull somebody. Because I just think chemistry-wise, that's, that, that's doing your team and the individuals more harm than good. And look, the same way the coaches are, or the players are searching for chemistry together, the coaches are searching for, you know, the rotation that's going to help them win games. And make no mistake, I mean, I, I've said this over and over, it's winning time now. It's not preseason. The coaches are doing everything they can to win ball games. They're going to play the lineups they believe will help them do so. And, you know, we've gotten to see glimpses of – Terrence Jones and some of the other rookies in preseason, the coaches are there working with these guys every single day. They've seen a hundred times more of these players in person than we've had the opportunity to, quite frankly. And, you know, I, I think to a certain extent, you have to believe because, again, this team's stated goal is to make the playoffs. They want to win. This isn't about, like, some conspiracy theory that they're trying to tank the season to get a high draft pick. No, that is, not, that is not the case. This team wants to be in the playoffs. They want to win, and they're going to try and play the best guys they can. But they're in the process of figuring out who those guys are as well. And, Craig, you make the great point about Chandler Parsons last year. If things continue to go poorly, you can rest assured changes will be made. But yeah, just but no, four that, games but you, in. That you can't make knee-jerk reactions because right. as, as, as players and coaches – you have to settle on a rotation. When you keep tinkering at that rotation, one, one different rotation here, one different rotation there, it just messes things up. When you get a bit of a trend, as in a handful of games, maybe two handfuls of games, then as a staff, you can evaluate where you are at that point and go, look, this is working, 
this is not working, we need to make a change here, we need to make a change there, and then once they make that change, and say they make that change and then they put and they, and they put one player into the rotation that wasn't, take one player who was in the rotation to pull him out, then again you're looking at another handful of games to see how that works before they can make some some adjustments. But anyhow, they, look, they are playing young players. I mean, everybody they're playing is young. This is the youngest team in the league. Their average experience is less than two years. All these players are young. James Harden is only 23 years old. What they're not doing is they're not playing with the guys with no playing guys with no experience. They're playing with guys with very little experience. So they are playing young players. Back to the questions. All right. <laughs> off my uh, I, I off know. my off my soapbox there. No, but, uh, I, but, Again, I'll go back to my original point. With all that said, I am still a bit surprised that Terrence Jones is not playing. Fair. I, I'm surprised that this has become like the dominant storyline. <laughs> it's everywhere. I just don't understand. I know. It. Yeah, it is. It is sort of a, a head scratcher. Um, but uh, look, I, I appreciate that people are passionate, and I absolutely appreciate that people are excited about the young players because uh, I'm sure they were paying attention during the summer league. But as I said, even when we were down in Vegas, there is a Grand Canyon's worth of difference between Summer League and preseason, and then about half that as well between preseason and what you see in the regular season. And again, we're just four games into this thing. Take a deep breath, relax, patience, whether we're talking about young players, whether we're talking about team chemistry and the offense and the defense and everything else, whether we're talking about the interaction uh, on the court between Jeremy Lin and James Harden. These things just take time, and, and you just really have to keep hammering that point home. Um, and again, you know, I think that we've obviously seen James Harden play at a very high level. That's very promising. Jeremy Lin has had moments as well, and, and also worth pointing out that Jeremy Lin right now, uh, after a career-high six steals last night, is number two in the NBA in terms of steals per game averaging 3.25, uh, only trailing Brandon Jennings, who has played one fewer game but averages four steals per game right now. Keep in mind, steals not the end-all, be-all of defense. We've talked about this all the time. Um, but for a Rockets team that wants to play up-tempo, uh, that's, those are big. Those are big plays because it means the ball's immediately going in the opposite direction. And let's face it, this team can use all the easy buckets it can get right now and Jeremy Lin, it's worth pointing out, too, this is not a fluke. Historically, he has been a very high guy from the standpoint of steals and block shots at the point guard position. All right, uh, all so, right comrade, let's get to the peeps. Back to right. the peeps. No, another question. Um, you know, a lot of people, and, and we've touched on this before, and I just want to focus on one guy today, Craig, because uh -huh. uh, a lot of people want to know, all right, you know, who are the Rockets going to go after at the trade deadline or in free agency? Um, obviously, there's no doubt whatsoever that one of the things I think that would help this team a lot um, is a low post presence. Okay, so we know that Utah with Jefferson, Millsap, and Cantor, and uh, Favors. Derek Favors, uh, they can't possibly hold on to all four of those guys, especially with Millsap and Jefferson being free agents. We know that Al Jefferson is the great Chuck Hayes told us time and time again. He thought Al Jefferson and Zach Randolph were the two toughest covers for him in the low post. Well, Craig, I'm going to get your thoughts and then I'll respond. What do you think about how Al Jefferson would be a fix or be a fit for this team in the short term and potentially in the big picture? Well, you know, look, I, I, we're talking in, in advance. Look, I agree with everything you said about, about Utah. They're going to have – they have some decisions to make. Um, now, Cantor doesn't seem like he's ready yet to become a full-time starter in the league. He's progressing. Um, but, but he's going to, nowhere. I mean, he, he and Favors one, to me are, are Favors are, are going nowhere. Um, you know, they, they, they've got Gordon Hayward at some point. They have to dress financially. Uh they have decisions to make. Favors contract, they have decisions to make in the next year or so in terms of what group they, they want to go forward uh, with. They're not going to, uh, my guess is they end up keeping one of the two, Jefferson or Millsap, after this season is all said and done. Um, but they do have, and look, former Rockets uh, front office guy Dennis Lindsay is now running things with the Utah Jazz. So he has some tough decisions to make in terms of where they want to go with their core group uh, going forward. Um, Al Jefferson is a ridiculously skilled offensive player with the lone exception for a guy that size 
his efficiency percentage is not, it could be better. He, 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 he doesn't shoot the percentage that you'd like him to shoot, but from a fit perspective, I think, again, we're talking about somebody else, somebody, some other team's players, but I think, hypothetically speaking, I think he would potentially uh, be a good fit uh, here with this team because some of his defensive efficiencies would be covered up by one Omer Ashik, and then you would get even bigger at that position. And again, he is a very skilled um, offensive player. Um, but again, it, it, it's tough to determine whether or not, look, they have to sit, you have to let things from a trade perspective play out. What happened on uh, right before the regular season started is super rare, a trade of that magnitude happening before a season begins. And it's almost as rare to have trades happen before the first week of December, the second week of December, because everybody's feeling out their rosters. They want to know what they have, what they don't have. I mean, again, Rockets have a glut of young talent. You're already complaining that guys like Jones and, and Demo and White aren't playing as it is. Well, hypothetically, do you want to add a player at that position long term, which further stunts the growth of, of one or more of those guys long term? Um, then ultimately, um, you know, you have to look at what's out there, perhaps maybe from an offense perspective, from a small forward position. Um, is Chandler a guy long term? Although Chandler performs extremely well at the jack of all trades, he's a glue guy on this team, and he's got the best contract in the NBA. So there's that to consider. But it, it, it's tough to uh, extrapolate and focus on the future because you just there's just too many factors. I mean, look, you, we brought this up on Tuesday. Does Memphis ultimately decide to break up their core? Uh, because they have so much money invested in four players. Well, they just had a new owner take over a couple of days ago. I don't see that happening, not in the short term, not if they want to burn the FedEx Forum down um, right off the bat when a new guy takes over the team. Um, and, so, and, and you're looking at DeMarcus Cousins for Sacramento. Does he ever fully realize his potential um, long term? I mean, did, did the Kings ultimately decide that his, his, uh, he's never had any off-the-floor issues, but on the court, He's been a little bit of a head case, and they decide that they decide to, to to fish and cut bait, to cut bait on him uh, long term. So you, you just you never know. Um, but you know, I think short term, I think Al Jefferson at the trade deadline, if Utah decides to deal him, could could be had for a less price than say somebody who's under contract for for the year, as if Utah decides to go in that direction. But again, the Rockets already have a glut of players anyway at the four. Well, and, and a couple of different things here, Craig, that I'd like to touch on. One, if you're, if you're focusing on Al Jefferson as a trade target, you also have to take into consideration what Utah would want and what is their need. I mean, we talked about the glut they have up front. So, obviously, you're talking wing players. Uh, a point guard specifically is what they need more than anything right now. What do the Rockets have from that standpoint to even offer? I mean, that's why I think behind, Josh Smith, from a trade perspective, fit makes more better. sense. Yeah, it makes more sense from a a potential hypothetical trade perspective as opposed to that because you're right. They they have almost although they're though those guys are playing, they have they have they have a log jam in the front court as well that they will have to alleviate. Yeah, I think I think that that's a, a more reasonable target. I mean, basically, if if you were to try and work something out with Utah, it would almost certainly have to be a three-team deal in order to meet their needs. Now, how Al Jefferson fits with this team, again, superior. And if you really want to deal with the Utah Jazz, I mean, seriously, the hated, <laughs> vile, loathsome Utah well, Jazz. I mean, do you really look, want to do that? If it if it makes you better, then sure. I, know, I, I mean, know, it's know. no secret that the Rockets. Uh, we're very interested in Darren Williams when he was with Utah as well before they pulled the trigger on that stunning blockbuster within New Jersey. Uh, but, but Al, great low post player, um, has a really low turnover rate. Um, my, my concern would be not a very good defender, but as you mentioned, that help is helped somewhat by playing next to a guy like Oshik. Uh, has a tendency to be a black hole, although he was an improved passer last year. Um, a lot of mid-range in his game, which I'm not crazy about because that means he's not attacking the rim and he's That's not going to the free throw line. That's why is lower than what you want from exactly. a guy that size. From, from an efficiency standpoint. Now, that's mitigated somewhat by the low turnover rate. Uh, but, it, but here is, is where I have some concerns about fit. Two things. One, if you trade for Al Jefferson and intend to keep him this summer, you're probably paying him close to max money. 
Now, does Al Jefferson as the final big piece of the puzzle put you no. in a championship contention? I don't think so. No. I, and, and, that, and, and really, I don't think Josh Smith does for that matter either in terms of potential free agents going forward. Probably not. And, and here's, here's the other issue is if I'm going to spend max or near max money on a big man to this team, you've got two really good to elite pick and roll players in the backcourt with Jeremy Lin and James Harden. Do you really want to bring in a, a big at max money who is not going to be a great pick and roll player off of those two? You know, I mean that that to me is is the biggest thing. You know, we're talking about a stagnant offense right now. Well, is tossing the ball into Al Jefferson and you know, again, like I said, not well, you're a great leading in more of a stretch for. Uh, well, I mean, in an ideal world, I, I'd like a guy like a young Amari Stoudemire who's going to play pick and roll with James Harden and Jeremy Lin and just going to give teams fits because it's a pick-your-poison type of situation. You know what I mean? We've even seen last night uh, where the Rockets would run pick and roll with James Harden and Omer Oshik, and that's just, you know, Omer, I love Omer, and he, he takes way too much heat for whatever offensive deficiencies he has. But the fact of the matter is he's not going to be Dwight Howard running the pick and roll with James Harden. Are you referencing those two alley -oop, uh, failed alley-oop attempts last night? I might be. I might be. Now, I've, <laughs> said, I've said this on Tuesday, and I'll say it again. What he gives you from extra possessions on offensive rebounds, oh, he's been fantastic. what he gives you uh, as a just great screen setter, not to yeah. mention the defense and the rebounding, He's All that fantastic. way, so way, way out. Could have hoped for. So much right. Better. Yeah. But um but I, I, I will say that um, you know, from a fit standpoint, yes, Al Jefferson gives you that low post threat, but I really want somebody who's gonna play off of James Harden and Jeremy Lynn, and that would be somebody who is going to be lethal as a big running to the hoop off of pick and rolls, and I don't see that being big Al. And like I said, to me, you bring in a guy like that, does he improve your team? Absolutely. Does he make you a championship contender? And he better make you close because if you're going to pay max money to somebody like that, then you're kind of locked in. Not necessarily like 100%, but your options have started to get pretty limited because now you've got max money committed to Harden and to Jefferson. And unless you want to – trade away Ashik or Lynn or both, then that's kind of your core going forward. Look, why, that look, why, look, we talked about this on Tuesday. Why are we even why, – I don't, what I don't understand is why people are even asking uh, <laughs> about this yet. I mean, look, we're only four games into the season. Yes, there are areas the team needs to improve upon, but people are already asking about, well, what about this guy and this guy? I mean, look, look Patrick Patterson's played very well. You let, let these guys – again, nobody's going to move anybody until the middle of December – at the earliest, if they do at all. Um, so let's just let's just see how this this, this group uh, works out. Now, I would I would say at this point a more pressing need is more it, it is more depth from your bench from a wing position, a, a point guard position, as opposed to trying to plug the hole um, with with a high salary player at this juncture. To me, that seems to be more of a pressing current need. All right. Rapid fire, Jason. Rapid fire. I, I don't. Uh, I don't even know if we have rapid time for rapid fire, Craig. Uh, we've got it. We've got to get rolling here. Uh, give, um, give, give me one more. Give, give me some red meat here. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Here's here's my favorite question of the day. Uh, David wants to know: Is the sky falling? And I think that pretty much sums it up. Send you know, a palm law. Send a palm law, <laughs> Jason. The sky is not it, falling. <laughs> it it speaks to the age in which we live. Honestly, that. Four You're with games. My French, aren't you? I really am. I mean, <laughs> you you are ready to move to Canada, Craig. I know I you am. are. Sign uh, me up right now. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think it speaks to the age in which we live. That a week ago, everybody's on cloud nine. Everybody's thrilled about James Harden. It feels like, hey, you know what? We know that growing pains are going to happen. That's okay. We're excited about the future. And now you lose two games in a row. Forget about the future. It's time to overreact. It's time to blow this thing up. And, hey, that is life in fandom. That is especially life in Twitterdom. 
Uh, nobody wants to talk about the move you made last week. It's not enough. You need to be a 65-win team right this second. Nobody wants to go through the growing pains. Mm. And, uh, you know, patience is a valuable and rather scarce commodity these days. I'll end with this. The great philosopher Rudy Tomjanovich used to say <laughs> <laughs> that in regards to professional sports, but obviously since he was an NBA coach and former player, the NBA specifically, um, things are never as good as they seem at the high end. Things are never as bad as they seem at the low end. The truth always lies somewhere in between. So, Jason, as you open up the show, shouldn't have overreacted to the first two wins and certainly not about to overreact now following two home court losses where the offense got bogged down. It's early in the season. Again, there are going to be – people need to understand – there are going to be plenty of growing pains with what is the youngest and least experienced roster in the NBA. And for the last time, they are playing young players. They aren't just playing the most, the least inexperienced players of the inexperienced players that they currently have. How about that? So let's That's unacceptable, that. Craig. I want overreaction. I want no. more moves right now. Forget about February trade deadline. I want another blockbuster. Ten days is way too long to wait no. in between monster trades. Well, if I tell you, if any other deals get done, it won't happen until December. So you might no. as well you need to sit back, relax, and wait for at least uh, another month. Well, that'll do it, Jason. Hey, look. How about the schedule for the Rockets coming up in Memphis tomorrow night? Always a, t a tough game. The Rockets own the Grizzlies in Houston, but they've now turned the trick on the Rockets in Memphis where Houston has lost three, three straight there. Rockets and for a team that's having problems with turnovers going against the Grizzlies. Yeah, it, they force more turnovers yeah. than like anybody in the league. I mean, right. Conley, Allen, and Gay, there's not a better threesome in the NBA from a wing perspective in the league at forcing and creating turnovers uh, than those three. The Rockets then wrap up their season series with the Detroit Slump Busters on Ooh. Saturday uh, at Toyota Center at 7 o'clock. The ticket 713-627-DUNK and log on to uh, Rockets.com, which you already are. And then LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh and company, and Shane Battier. Shane Battier, I was just about to say. That, that's his first time back in Houston. Yes, yes it is. Uh, the defending champion Heat are in town on Monday. Um, and uh, so uh, some interesting games uh, coming up for the Rockets again. Uh, winless at home undefeated on the road, and hopefully that trend at least for one more game can, can continue tomorrow night uh, in Memphis. But, Jason, thanks for the contributions as always. Yeah, thanks, Craig. And we'll be back, uh, I guess, Tuesday morning Yeah, Tuesday. the Miami game. Yep, we'll do this again on Tuesday. Uh, so, folks, again, for Jason Friedman, I am Craig Ackerman. Thanks to all of you for all of your questions, comments, and views. We appreciate that. And this, of course, was yet Even another. the overreaction. We appreciate and, that, too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for watching another award winning edition of Rockets Cast Live right here on Rockets.com. Have a great weekend, everybody.